welcome to another edition of the talk show Dialogue. Again, we met in a European country to discuss local issues and give that an international view. We are in Skopje, the capital of what is being named North Macedonia right now. Today we s uh, will discuss the overall question, what story we want to tell about Europe now and in the future. We gave our audience the task to specifically come up with uh, statements around two points of view, and that would be, first, reasons for Macedonia to join the EU, and reasons for the EU to include Macedonia. Also, we asked our, um, our audience to uh, discuss that in a very critical way. So, and as easy as these topics sound, at first, there are really valid reasons to discuss those topics very critical. Therefore, we invited three experts. First, Christian Rissov, and he is a history student, and uh, he is currently in his master degrees, right? And he will provide us with facts and uh, try to get us on track while we lose maybe ourselves in emotional and feeling-based discussions that are not really based on facts. So thanks for being here. And that is your applause. <laughs> and then we are very happy to have Biljana Wankowska here. She is a professor at the Un Faculty of uh, Philosophy, and she has a PhD in political science, right? And she is really a political expert. That is your applause. <laughs> and then we have Miroslav Draganov. Um, he has a degree in constitutional law, which is also very interesting uh, regarding those discussions that we will have here. And he's the executive director of the Institute for Human Rights in Skopje in Macedonia. And the Institute for Human Rights implements um, projects from the EU and Macedonia. All right, <laughs> that's your applause. Especially to the sensitivity of this topic, we strongly focus on keeping this discussion factual, respectful, and diverse. And now I would like to ask one person of the audience to join me in front here and give us a statement of what you have dis just discussed in the last couple of minutes and hours. Please say your name and where you come from. Hey, uh, I'm Elias, I come from Germany and uh, we had uh, the question about uh, discuss reasons for the EU to include Macedonia and my immediate reaction was this is the a stupid, a senseless question, because the whole mission of Europe is an inclusive object, it's a democratic idea with freedom of speech and, and many other uh, values that we are highly regard. So if an independent nation wants to join and it's part of Europe, right, then they should just join. Miroslav, do you want to state your opinion on that? Uh, I must agree, uh, because um, uh, as uh, previous we discussed today, uh, my mission is one Europe only, and I say that uh, European Union is not the European Union itself, but the whole Europe. And uh, the mission when it started, like uh, from uh, 1950s, from Robert, uh, Robert Schuman and Jean Monnet, uh, its vision to, uh, to be one united uh, Europe uh, uh, under uh, the spectrum of European Union, and that's why if we share our values and we are at the same territory, it's a logical and uh, it's uh, just a matter of time when we will be officially put it a stamp to be in. So, but would you say that uh, the, stamp of a, the stamp that you want to get should be the EU? Do you think that would be the right stamp or is it more like a broader sense? But it doesn't really matter how you frame it. In the end, it comes down to political structures that you have, right? So um, you can say Europe in general is a good idea, but still you have to implement it in some way and give it some structure. Would be the EU the way to go? Um, okay, we are a country in the Balkans. Uh, we, uh, as a part of this globalized world, 
uh, we are um, it's um, naturally to be part of uh, some bigger bigger community uh, our pet through through last uh, let's say two decades or three decades uh, is the pet towards European Union and uh, uh, that's our uh, how to say naturally chosen uh, pet through these years and uh, if we don't choose this uh, this pet obviously we have to choose some other path but uh, when you when you when you see uh, the territory uh, current situation our neighbors where they strive to be or they are into which which uh, um, union uh, which uh, let's say common uh, common united uh, community it is european union and that's why it's naturally to be to be part there and to strive but of course uh, i must say that um, all decisions uh, into that are better when we we share uh, the same table and we have uh, one chair into that table and there we can discuss and we can share we can challenge our views our uh, let's say uh, pros and cons, our uh, values, our arguments uh, for future common development. That's why that's why uh, we strive to be part of the table where we naturally uh, we are. All right. Thank you very much. From a Macedonian view, Biljana, do you have a statement on that? Yes. Uh, probably there is a generation gap between. Uh, the previous speaker and myself. I come from a generation of 59. I was born in former Yugoslavia. So I grew up in a integrated, uh, diverse society made of various nations, cultures, confessions, and everything else. So that was a big disappointment, as you know. You all know how Yugoslavia ended. So uh, yes, since 1991, we had to reconsider our position where we are within the larger uh, Balkan and European context. And it's true that uh, since uh, early 80s, uh, uh, sorry, early 90s, uh, there was the philosophy of there is no alternative, TINA principle, which is related to Margaret Thatcher, as you know well. Uh, which means that uh, European Union and NATO have become a secularized religion. So if you say to the general public, to the school children, to ordinary citizens, there is no alt other alternative. We have to join NATO and European Union, otherwise there will be no state of our own at all. So in my view, it is a rather naive, um, politically probably, uh, good position, but it is naive because uh, if we are fair to uh, judge the situation in our country, we should be honest to say that we do not deserve to join European Union right now. We are not ready to do so. First of all, we do not meet the key, uh, the, the Copenhagen criteria, and we cannot uh, actually adjust to European acquis. So these are sad facts, which means that our long transition since 1991 was made of a lot of uh, Monty Python silly walks uh, policy. So we were going back and forth and so on and so forth. In my view, maybe because of my, uh, my personal experience, um, uh, Macedonia and the whole region of the Balkans belongs to Europe regardless whether we are going to join it or not. I'm not even sure that the European Union is going to last for too long. We are waiting for the European elections soon. There are dark clouds over Europe. So my position is a position of Eurosceptic. I'm not Europhop, I'm not Europhil, I'm a Eurosceptic. Skeptic in terms of being critical toward the state of affairs rising populism, xenophobia, rising economic um, um, disbalance between the countries, the European core countries, Germany, 
first of all, and the periphery, let's take the example of Greece, uh, Portugal, Spain, and other. So in meantime, what bothers me the most is that our government, our governments in, in whole this period, did not develop any alternative policy in terms of a long way to the European Union. We, we do not have a blank check that yes, you're welcome, you will be part of the European Union. Second, what I teach my students is first of all to make a difference between Europe as a concept, as idea, as a geographic space, political space, and European Union. In my critical and leftist view, European Union is not so much about peace, happy family, prosperity, brotherhood, and unity. It is how we call it in former Yugoslavia. But it is about economy. It is about the capital. It is about the corporate interests. And yes, indeed, it is a question. What would Macedonia contribute to such a large economic financial sector as European Union? Uh, presents. So uh, my alternative would be to work more hardly on a regional integration. If we are supposed to join a wider integrative processes and, and structures. First of all, we should prove that we are able to communicate, to cooperate, to work together, to appreciate each other here in the region. Macedonia, with Greece, with Bulgaria, with Serbia, with Kosovo, with Bosnia, with, with the whole space of, if you s want to put it, to Western Balkans. Or and finally, maybe I should uh, keep it <laughs> short here. Finally, I think uh, we should not forget that there are our countries that do not belong to the European Union and belong to Europe. Uh, I'm not talking about Brexit and uh, United Kingdom, but about uh, Switzerland, Norway, uh, and Iceland, of course, and, and some other uh, parts of Europe that have full right to consider themselves Europeans people who contributed to the European civilization, culture, and everything. Yes, we are poor, we are small, we are microstate, but still, we, I, I have never had any complex being a European. I was always, and I will be probably always European. Yes, I'm nostalgic because I grew up in, the, in that country, but that gave me the, the, the advantage of knowing how it looks to live in a wider political community, to really have this exchange and to be exposed to different uh, cultural and other uh, influences and, and to try to respect. Yes, I am very sorry that it failed and, and it ended in bloody war, but it, that was a useful life experience for me. Uh, thank you very much. I have one more question. So that especially our younger stu uh, students and younger viewers, who viewers uh, can understand what you just said. Because at the very first beginning you dropped the name of NATO as well, and EU as well. And maybe you can briefly explain what the connection and the relation between EU and NATO is, and uh, what that is from a Macedonian standpoint. Just briefly, please. It is uh, 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 these two uh, separate different organizations with different goals, structures, uh, institutional architecture, whatever, are taken as a twin uh, strategic goal for this country. So they always go together. We are talking about joining NATO and EU as if they are the same thing. They are definitely very different things. And we also know that some European countries are members of Euro, uh, European Union, but not of NATO and vice versa. So uh, in the policy view of this country, these, things, these two things uh, come together and the official version is that we must join NATO in order to join European Union, which is not true, of course. But that is the official policy. Thank you very much. Christian. Thank you. Uh, obviously, I present a different generation when we, when we spoke of it previously. I'm born in 1994, and I'm one of the, let's say, uh, recently graduate historians, people who are just getting involved into these international matters. So that's my standpoint, at least. 
from start, I would like to say that I'm a very uh, pro European, pro European Union person, pro Western, even I would, that's how I would define myself at least. Uh, some good points were made, especially about the differentiation between Europe and the European Union. What is the EU? What is Europe? Where do we belong? Uh, one question that would, would always arise is, of course, whether the European Union is how Europe should be united, because it's obvious that we're like on one continent and that we have to collaborate between each other, have to have a decent amount of collaboration, but the question is whether the European Union is the right type of organization that should be the one spearheading this union. And these, this is the way, this is the point at, w at which people who are for collaboration between the European countries can be divided between themselves. So some would say that the European Union, its formats, it has a negative impact on the countries, some would say it has a positive, and that's the debate whether, even between countries who are already members of the European Union, I believe there are, of course, waves who are, whether this should keep going, it should stop, or we should change it. It is of my belief that the current format of the European Union is good, it's quality. Of course, everything can, can always be improved, but I firmly believe that our country would fit into uh, the European Union itself, although uh, I would have to agree also with uh, the professor that uh, we need to work on our situation first in order for the our integration into the Union, if we are already getting into it, we need to first set the standards, everything to be okay, so that that transition into a larger market, into a different economy, different organization to be smoother. Because if we do it abruptly without proper preparation, it can be damaging for us and maybe even for the European Union itself. So before we enter the Union, we need to make sure that these criteria are are so are filled. Yeah. So. Excuse me? Yeah, just one thing, and I believe that the recent events that have happened are a step in the right direction, although there's still a lot more work to be done for the country itself to ascend into the Union, but I'm very confident that we're heading to the right path of, of So you're an expert in history. And yeah. looking back on the history of this region, and the Macedonian region, uh, where the name changed so many times, the rulers who ruled that region changed so many times, as we learned, um, can you understand why anybody cares that a name change is a problem in order to get to, the, um, uh, to, to, to fulfill EU standards? Yes, well, the, the name is obviously a conflict between just two countries who are uh, debating it. I don't think anyone else like from the region or farther away really would care what the country is called, or well, this is a dispute between two countries. However, in order for the European Union to function as it should, each country who belongs to that union should agree on key matters such as these. So it's not just a question of whether someone is offended or someone uh, finds it disturbing uh, regarding the use of the name. It's also, I would say, like a political power movement, like what should be yours, what should be, let's set some proper boundaries, because if we want to collaborate between each other first, first we need to rule out all the potential disagreements that we may have, because we don't want to get inside an organization with a conflict. We need to resolve everything from the start, and to once we get into this union, to collaborate together with those problems and the troubles putting in behind the past. There have been opportunities and different types of negotiations. It often led to a stalemate, but now it seems that the problem has been initially resolved. Of course, it's too early to tell us always. I, I believe personally that we're on a good path, as I said previously, I said it a few times, but I believe that it's going well, but I cannot predict you know, the, the future exactly. I don't want to make a, that bold claim, but I believe that it's going well and that this is a, a good move for the country and for the region itself. Thank you. Um, Elias, if you wouldn't be a member state as Germany of NATO and EU, would you be willing to change the name of Germany to enter the EU? Well, um, as a married man, uh, I've been through this dis or oh, a similar discussion <laughs> like three years ago. Um, so I, I know the emotions of a name and um, the, the, the reason is the goal and, uh, and if the, the goal is worth the price. 
right? Uh, then that is where where I stand on on this the issue. If you put it to Germany, well, how you how you want to call Germany, right? In which language do you want to call it? Uh, have you named it Orsak or Saxa or Tuskland, Alemannia, right? W the name is just it's just a communication tool from from a some point of view, but but the goal what I want to reach, right? And that's uh, for me the important part. Like if 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 I want and have an institution that combines Europe. And then, of course, how I want to develop this institution is something I can better steer when I'm inside than when I'm outside. Right? When, when we look back on the, on the uh, 68 revolutions in, in many European countries, there was the one part decided, okay, let's just fight and bomb and whatever, and the other side said, oh, well, let's join political parties and try to change it from the inside. And some changes took place, and it was a long and hard work, uh, a walk, and about 30 years later, many changes, like, International Women's Day, and, and things have happened and have changed because people have joined the institutions and have changed it from the inside to make it that what they want it to be. Any comments? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to add something upon of all of this discussion. Um, as, a, as a man who works in human rights issues, uh, I must remind ourselves that all international human rights documents were established after the World War II. So after people feel on their own that the uh, sacrifice, that uh, um, um, uh, that your heart will be break when your relative will die, no matter if you are German, if you are French, if you are Macedonian, if you are Greek, you will say, okay, let's stop this and back to our, not to positive law, not to legal state, but to natural, naturality, our humanity. Let's uh, start from here. And I will not agree that uh, European Union will not last. Uh, European Union will last until there is no war, until May. Uh, according to, uh, to, to, my, to my opinion, uh, when, you uh, when you go back with all unions, with all, everything was uh, destroyed uh, with war. And after the war, there is human, uh, let's say, uh, narrative to be together, to be a brotherhood uh, and so on and so on. And that's why uh, maybe a long period when there is no war, we strive to, you know, to be selfish as a people and to focus on our selfishness. And uh, me, as, um, as a human who, who, who was directly uh, influenced by the politician uh, decisions, by nationalist decisions, because my brother was, a, was killed because of some political uh, nationalistic uh, decisions, uh, without emotions now, I, I uh, like uh, 11 years, 12 years later, I must say that I uh, choose to, to be human first, not to go against hate crime and, uh, you know, like uh, to, to, to have hate speech according to others, but to sit on the same table and to discuss. Because uh, what will, if, if, if I continue, what will happen? I don't want my nephew to be revenge or he to revenge somebody else for that. I want to be in to, 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 to speak what connect us, not what disconnect us. Thank you for sharing this, by the way. And um, Biljana, maybe you can add something on that because I have one specific question to that. Okay, and maybe, that would maybe you want to ask you. me the question? Yeah, yeah, please I want please to ask you the question. Please. And that would be, um, even though you said that the European Union, Union is not about peace, it's more about economical structures, and uh, would you still think that the EU sustains peace in a way? Uh, you are reading my mind. <laughs> Actually, that was supposed to be my um, comment. Uh, yes, the official story goes uh, since the end of the Second World War, the first community, reconciliation between Germany and France, and blah, blah. But, um, a uh, philosopher, a young philosopher from Croatia, Srećko Horvat, who is also a member of DiEM, um, took part in a talk show with me some years ago, maybe 
couple of years ago uh, in the region, in Belgrade, and he made a statement that I find even more accurate today as it was two years ago. He said, yes, there is allegedly no war. European Union got uh, Nobel Peace Prize, for God's sake. We don't know why so many decades after the end of the war and reconciliation, it got Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, nevertheless, Srečko said that there is a civil war ongoing within the European Union. And he was talking about the social movements, the, the things that are maybe hidden from the headlines of the media, but that the social uh, class war, if you want, in leftist terms, is ongoing. What Can you we be are a going bit more with, what, specific on what Yes, that is? I am going to be specific. Sorry. Yes, what we see week by week going in France doesn't look like peace. I also teach at peace studies, so I can, I, can, I can also argue that there is something that we call negative peace, which means absence of physical violence, and positive peace, which means all these conditions for personal development, emancipation, humanity, solidarity, uh, right of each and everyone to have uh, access to work, to decent quality uh, of life, education, uh, mobility, social mobility, coming from a lower class and, and rising up uh, according to uh, talents and, and uh, abilities and so on and so forth. So it is uh, really for you Europeans to ask yourselves <laughs> why there are so many populist movements, why so much nationalism, so much uh, xenophobia, fear from foreigners. We are talking ad about the concept of fortress Europe. Europe is not open anymore. It is open for capital. It is open for money, for investments, and for labor force to some degree, but not for ordinary people. Even there are discrepancies and, and uh, differences, social differences and gaps within the European society. So let's not be so romantic when we talk about the European Union. You probably know far much b better than me. I don't know, but uh, thanks for sharing. Um, before we get to you, Andreas, I have one additional question, and that would be maybe that would be the right moment to tell our audience why you founded DM25 as well as other people, and what DM25 is about. Oh, I'm not sure that I'm the right person to speak on their behalf. Uh, to be honest, uh, yes, I am one of the first people who joined, and Srečko Horvat was the one who asked me on behalf of Varoufakis and the others. It is quite an amazing group of people, including Chomsky and, and, and uh, Assange uh, and other people that joined DM. And as you know, uh, they are running now at the European elections uh, under the coalition named uh, European Spring. Uh, and Varoufakis is uh, really a fascinating man. He is so, so um, different uh, polit uh, type of politician. I was amazed when he was a uh, finance minister of Greece during a very critical time in 2015. He was struggling with the Eurogroup. He was struggling for the justice for ordinary poor people in Greece, in his country, and that was really a a very sad story. We we visited Greece and we go there regularly on vacation. You can imagine, even the nationalists <laughs> like me. So I, I'm in love with Greece and with the Greek people. And uh, in many of these uh, observations, I share the same opinions with many of my Greek colleagues coming from the left. Uh, yes, why? They are because I believe that left is the only option to unite people on, on this international ground, regardless uh, differences uh, among ourselves. We don't have really problem with the name Macedonia. I mean, it's, it's stupid, and we consider that like something really ridiculous. But uh, sadly, Syriza ended up as a neoliberal uh, party. It's not far left anymore. So yes, that's why Varoufakis as al alternative. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, DiEM25 means uh, democracy in Europe. Yes. 
yes. right? movement. Yes. And uh, I strongly recommend you, if you want to get to know more about Yanis Varoufakis and what happens in Greece, to read the book Adults in the Room. It's actually a sort of a follow-up question on, on the question you just asked. So, so I actually, I mean, as a very pro-European, I'm from Sweden, Andreas, uh, currently live in Ukraine, so outside of the European Union. Um, and I actually agree with a lot of the questions and the critics that you have. But And you started to, to talk about um, alternative of, of sort of a regional partnerships. And I, I would just like, could you elaborate more of how that would actually mean? And are you actually sort of completely against Macedonia being in the European Union or just like very critical to how the European Union look like? Or what is your actual vision like so uniting left wing like what what does it mean like what is your uh, some of my colleagues and myself uh, think about the idea of uh, tighter balkan integration maybe some kind some form of balkan federation even is it like yugoslavia in uh, wider yugoslavia extended yugoslavia maybe uh, not it is not sadly because of the legacy of the conflicts and wars I it won't be possible anytime soon you, it's just enough to see the relationships between serbia and croatia and bosnia it's very complex but uh, it is a vision for the future, of course. Uh, also, I don't think that we are going to join European Union. It is not a matter whether I like it or not. It is a matter of objective uh, facts, criteria, uh, uh, constellations in the European Union, the will of some certain members of the European Union, they are very critical in terms of the enlargement policy because they, nobody wants to import problems. Macedonia is like, I'm sorry to, maybe I'm, I'm really uh, saying things oh. that are very different from the, the two younger colleagues here, but uh, you may understand that I'm cynical, I'm critical, I'm quite uh, coming to age of 60 and I've seen a lot in my life. And uh, as they are in love with European now, I was in love with my former homeland. And it, it, nobody, if ever anybody told me that it would end in Srebrenica, in Sarajevo, in Vukovar, I would never, ever believe that. So really, I don't think that European integrations and, and organizations uh, are made for good forever for eternity nothing even the empires the um, roma empires and and i don't know whatever you want they last for some time they reach the peak and then they go downhill i don't want that to happen to european union i want to see it transform from within to make it more democratic to eliminate the democratic deficit of the european union non-transparent decision-making, uh, running uh, the policies more in favor of the rich classes rather than poor people, because people are really poor in Greece, in Bulgaria, in Romania. So nobody can really uh, make me believe that by simply joining the European Union, all our problems will be over. But isn't so it more about the process of reforms that lead you towards the European Union that also leads the country yes, to Yes, uh, and, and uh, here I, I would like to refer to this name change. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of our uh, meeting here, I'm very much against the PRESPA agreement and I worked hard maybe over a year or two to, to make my voice and the voices of the other critics uh, hurt in the European Union. All the media were closed down. Nobody wanted to talk to us. We were labeled nationalists, extremists, anti-Western oriented, whatever. So uh, in my view, if we really honestly want to join European Union, the name change would least assist on that way. It was the least thing we can, you can put a, a different label on a bottle of uh, Coke and, and say that it's Fanta or, or, or I don't know, vodka or Russo, whatever. 
but it will still inside the bottle you will have the same content so for this government the easier way the easiest way to change allegedly something was okay let's fix this problem with greece and then we will move on no we are not moving on because we still have the same level of uh, economic uh, uh, disaster, <laughs> political corruption, nepotism, uh, politicized judiciary, and, and uh, not free media, and you name it. So all the list of the problems, which is not, of course, a product of this government, but of the whole governance type of governing uh, in, in the previous, by previous elites uh, since 1990s, uh, they are still here with us. So uh, it is very hard to believe that only because we are now North Macedonia, we are getting closer to Sweden. No, we are still here on this uh, southern part of Europe. We still belong to periphery. We still do not meet even the basic criteria. And worst of all, the PRESPA process, the process that led to name change and the change of the constitution was made on the sake of all democratic principles, including rule of law, all basic principles of the constitution and the legal norms and even the code of conduct of the parliament, everything, every single norm was violated and this name change was made against the will of the majority of the population, so it was imposed. Sorry, but you were asked uh, if you would protest if Germany has to change name for something better. But we did not choose to, to change our name. It was imposed. So now I am I'm, um, under sanctions. I have to use the name of North Macedonia to my students to write textbooks about North Macedonia. So even the freedom of speech and academic work is now limited to myself if, if I want to use the public money. If I want to do it privately, I am free to do so. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Sorry um, for taking so long. No, it's, a, it's OK. It's actually important. Everybody should take their time to explain properly what they think. Um, Miroslav, you as a con constitutional law expert, do you think that agreement was against the law? Um, as a lawyer first, and uh, sorry, <laughs> not only constitutional, I must say that uh, during last years, not only about PRESPA agreement, a lot of constitutional law principles and rule of law were, uh, break, uh, were broke in, uh, um, here. What that means, if from the previous government as well, and from this one as well. But uh, me as a student of uh, first or second year at the faculty, when I, and I, when I was um, on the subject international law, I said, this is not international law, this is international politics. Mm -hmm. And after years, it happened in practice. And I just my thesis from that time happened here because everything the law is a little bit slave of w political will in context of press by agreement is international and it's wider will not only mm -hmm. the the will here and uh, we as a lawyers uh, must be aware of that and uh, it's not and uh, always politics law and economy are uh, connected somehow and this world is not uh, lead and developed only by political and law, uh, as I say, said before, like positive uh, rules, positive principles, but also by money, by economical development of all segments of, of, of our societies. That's why I must say that these emotions were not uh, to anybody, no matter if it's more pro mm -hmm. agreement or more more against agreement. No one was, uh, let's say, without emotions about, uh, it's not easy to change uh, your name, your feelings, and so on. It's not easy at all. But uh, we must be realistic as well. And to be, to, to be here all the time, uh, I'm 
the person who have one theory in life that everything is solvable except that man to become alive again. Everything else is solvable if there is a will to solve it. And of course, this war, this is compromise. And uh, now or in the future or uh, so on, I don't know when it will be, but I it's fact that 27 years we were in transition period. You know, I will I will bring all discussions on one point. For example, uh, uh, the professor said uh, uh, the economic uh, problem still here and so on. M friends of mine said, for example, ah, there are European standards for this, for this, for this, but not uh, bigger uh, salary or more opportunities and so on. Yeah, I ask him, okay, uh, like 15 years ago, you are the same. Not even learn English, not even learn how to write a project. Come on, learn English, learn how to write a project, and you will have double salary at the very beginning. But he, says, he said, ah, I have no time. So where is the problem? So there are opportunities if we want to develop and to be into them. Uh, uh, and also it's fact that we are just one, if we are chess, we are just one figure. We are not, and we are not the king. We are one peon. So that's it. Thank you for that very, very valid and interesting statement. Uh, Christian, you wanted to add something, right? Yeah, sure, well, back on the topic that we mentioned briefly you know previous empires and kingdoms countries who yes. had a rapid rise and then decline we even mentioned that in the previous presentations as well um let's for, for a brief moment take out the north macedonia and the european union out of the equation and just consider the economy itself like the form of what we're actually involved in if we can trace back things like decades or centuries ago the most successful entities, unions, countries, whichever it is, the strongest ones were those who learned how to control, how to implement the economical system to their benefit. Now, s eventually when that system crashed, when there were problems, the country itself crashed. But when the economy prospered, when the country itself was stable, when the entity had good regulations, there was peace in that country and it was, it was stable. So. I would say, I would argue actually that the economy, the economical stabilization is the key principle that we need to possess, that we need to strive for, that we need to achieve if we want there to be peace and progress. It's not the other way around or any difference. The economy is the main thing that we always need to focus on if we want peace and prosperity, as we, as we always say. And it is of my belief that the current system of the European Union, as I mentioned previously, it actually possesses these um, institutions who do proper regulations of the economy because if you take a look at the demographical, economical, whichever different types of charts and the well-being of the population of the countries that live inside the European Union, it's obvious that on, on this term the countries are stable. Yes, there are, there are problems, as we said, there are at times riots, protests and dissatisfaction but this has often been resolved. And when you, when you take a look at the bigger picture, you can see a straight line of progress for any country who has entered the European Union. Those countries that entered the Union itself but weren't like fully prepared for integration had a turbulent process into its integration, but eventually they overcame this, whether it's with the help of the Union or by hard work and everything, and they eventually set their record straight and the pointing arrow pointing upwards on the green arrow, things like that. So that's why I believe that as long as we have a union which is economically strong in terms of the market and what the union itself represents, this is not something that can easily crash and dissolve itself because it's obvious that this is a pretty stable thing since there hasn't been like a single country which has had a serious decline after joining. In opposite, actually, all of the countries that join have a serious upheaval when it comes to the European Euro Union. Okay, yeah, maybe uh, maybe Cyprus, right? But yeah, you actually uh, you you actually opened room for a lot of other questions. But still, I would like to uh, welcome Marlies here in this our circle, and I'm pretty sure that your statement will add up perfectly to what Christian just said. Uh, my name is Marlies. I'm from the Netherlands, uh, and indeed, you were already doing what I was thinking of doing, of to change the perspective 
Um, so you took in the historical perspective, and I thought, let's look at it from the moon. Uh, in I have two teenage sons, and in the near the bedroom, there's this world map. And when you look at the world map, you see these huge countries, China, Russia, United States, Canada, Brazil, and then you have Europe, da, 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 I mean, many, many countries. And when you look at it from a distance, you wonder, so how, what is Europe? What is our story? And how should we look into the future, given what we are part of? I mean, not even including the universe, right? But let's just only look at it as the world. So if you take a distance, I would be so curious to hear how, if you look, would look at that world map, and not the technicalities, right? And we're not perfect at all. But what would be your story for Europe? Mm -hmm. Should I start? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 in one center, in one sentence, uh, together we are stronger in every aspect. If we are together in this room, and I want, don't care about everybody, and I want this chair to bring to the camera, but I don't look how to go there and to ignore, but there are people to be there, but I want to be. It's much uh, difficult for me, and there are so many obstacles, right? But if two of us, three of us, stand up from there together, bring the chair, it will be easy for us. So that's uh, in every sense, in every aspect. Uh, economical is one aspect, political, law, and so many and so many aspects there are. But of course, we are together to Coop, uh, to cooperate with each other, to have competition instead of competition. Because if we are connected somehow and edit ourselves on uh, economical uh, way, collaboration, let's say, and uh, also in political, we are not enemies. We are collaborators. It's lower risk of any conflict. It's lower risk to human beings to, to die. It's lower risk any, anything to be destroyed but it's more opportunities for both of us, maybe not the best. Maybe if I go alone, I will be selfish and I will receive everything, you know? I will be uh, the first who will bring chair there. But if we go together, we will share it and we will be happy together. That's why we are together, we are stronger in every aspect. Um, thank you, it's a wonderful question. And uh, I think, uh, I'm sorry to repeatedly uh, say his name, Varoufakis has a very good answer for that. He just mentions tr Star Trek. The vision of Star Trek, of United Federation, of uh, the Earth, the planet Earth, and the other worlds, and so on and so forth. That is basically the leftist idea idea that diminishes the states, nations, uh, diversities are free to, to flourish, but not to divide people. So yes, Europe is very specific in that uh, regard, but don't forget that European countries, the big ones, used to be colonizers. They left marks in Africa, in, in other parts of the world, and if you ask me, I would quote uh, Montesquieu, he said, I am basically a human and only by chance I'm a French, or secondly, uh, I am a French. So if you ask me, I would say, yes, I'm first of all a human. And I grew up in a country where we belong to neither of the military political blocs, uh, neither NATO nor Warsaw Pact. So we belong to the non-aligned movement. And I grew up thinking that we need to show solidarity with all poor people from Africa, Asia, Latin America, and so on. Now, it is very hard to me when the official policy and, and uh, the media and the whole this uh, framework tells me that I must be anti-Western if I mention that I show solidarity with some other parts of the world. Or if I want to, for example, my dream is to travel in Iran uh, next fall. I plan that. So I would really like to e experience by myself to see that culture, to taste that food, to see with my own eyes if these people are so bad, so dangerous, are they terrorists, 
I know that they are not, of course. I, I know that it's perfectly safe. But we live in a world where Euro, uh, Eurocentrism uh, frames our minds and our actions. Yes, European Union has uh, a very ambitious uh, foreign and security policy. It has strategic partnerships with United States, with China, with Russia, with these major powers. So European Union is not just a romantic uh, place on earth. It has its own legitimate economic, political, security interests. And they are trying to preserve them best to their knowledge. Maybe, yes, we belong to that, to that society, to that uh, circle. But on the other hand, why should we uh, limit ourselves only to Europe? I grew up in a different world. Yes, I admit it. It was uh, during the Cold War when, when on one hand we had these uh, Westerners and Easterners. Uh, I was neither of that. And I, I grew up as a free person. So probably that's what my limitation nowadays, that I, I just can't fit in this uh, narrow, for myself, it is a narrow European story. You asked us to, to see from the sky, from the universe. Yes, uh, Earth is so tiny, so small, so precious, so beautiful. We need to care because a lot of uh, the of of these major challenges um, ask uh, solidarity on a global scale. We cannot uh, resolve the problem of pollution, of uh, uh, pollution of seas and and the air and everything else if we stick to our geopolitical blocks like we are Europeans and you are Chinese and no we need to cooperate that's my answer. since since one additional question on that since we have your expertise here and your yes, okay. experience um, you mentioned that Yugoslavia was a block free state actually a block free st state yes, it, it, it belongs to neither block yes, yes. and maybe you can just briefly explain that that was not only a yugoslavian idea but also other countries uh yes it was uh, the idea uh when the cold war got to, to its a very dangerous peak of a possibility of a nuclear war when um, then leader tito the uh, the president tito and uh, indira gandhi and uh, the Egyptian president, uh, a lot of presidents, uh, leaders from the third world. So we naturally positioned uh, our country uh, in relationship to these small, uh, poor nations that should stick together in order to have their interest uh, heard in United Nations, first of all, of course. So that was a specific uh, organization which uh, did not have this institutional uh, background as European Union has, or even NATO and, and the other organizations. It was more not formal, but they would coordinate and work together, cooperate on economic, cultural, and other levels in order to uh, stick somewhere in between the two blocks. And Yugoslavia actually fell apart. And, and uh, the, t the tragedy of Yugoslavia was the end of the Cold War, sadly so. Everybody was happy because there were no divisions anymore. But Yugoslavia was possible as a buffer zone between the two blocks and paid a too, too high price in human lives, as you know. It was, uh, uh, of course, uh, not to misunderstand me, I don't say that others are to be blamed for the catastrophe that took place, but uh, there were internal problems, and then the geopolitical situation uh, switched and changed, and some of the parts of Yugoslavia decided, for example, the motto of the, uh, of the Slovenian Spring uh, in 1990s was Europe Now. They actually made the first step towards secession with the motto Europe Now. That, that move and secession of uh, Slovenia meant immediate war to Croatia, in Croatia, then in Bosnia, in Kosovo, Macedonia as well. So it, it was really a dramatic time. Thank you very much. So again, looking from the moon on the earth, yeah, well, your thoughts. Some opinion that would like to contest mainly about an online movement. 
yes, maybe at the beginning it began as something of a third block, and when we think of it like a non-aligned movement, a third option, like people who decided to stay out of the politics of the major forces of the Westerns and Eastern uh, blocks, it sounds maybe a bit too good to be true, because maybe it's, it's, it started like that, like a third option for every other country, but eventually the, the non-aligned movement, according to at least recent re uh, research, uh, pretty much received subsidies from the Western allies, from the United States of America, the US, and uh, it kept on to be more like a buffer for uh, preventing the Soviet and the communist impact into these countries and other countries as well, l instead of serving it like a, a zone between the two. So it was more of a pro-Western aligned organization or entities who decided to join up together, although not officially, but its actual purpose was to, to serve this. As for a uh, variety of other, other countries as well, uh, it's true, I, for example, yes, as I said at the beginning, I'm pro-European, but doesn't mean that you know, other countries are not worth visiting or collaborating with. We live in a pretty open society right now, and if, if even if you belong at a certain block, it's not like in the 20th century when you have to shut down everyone, you can still collaborate with other people. Three months ago, I visited Kenya in Africa, and I had business and professional uh, connections with those people, and I really enjoyed my time staying there. But still, these are, are, are even though there are still you know smart people who we had a great collaboration with, it doesn't mean that there are people who you need to fit in the same block. You still need to uh, press into those who are closer to you and start from there. Maybe in the future, after the Europe unites itself properly with all the countries belonging in itself, there can be an even larger movement for a better joining of other countries as well, and even further collaboration. But you have to start from the home base and then expand onwards. So that's at least my opinion on the topic when it comes to Europe itself. One final thing uh, I would like to say, because we, we mentioned Greece, but uh, the subject changed. Uh, that's also uh, something major that I wanted to point out. Uh, when Greece was formed in the beginning of the 19th century, the first thing they did after the country itself was formed, they borrowed money from England and France. So the country started in debt and is still in debt from now. So the European Union is not the reason that Greece is going down. They're actually very low from the start and they're just trying to upheave from there. But um, I think the European Union is still something that is even helping them more than they, they actually realize because from the foundation of the country itself, they have been in a negative sum when it comes to money because they, they borrowed money to begin with to start the country. Yes. But one more than one century before the European Union itself Union was started. Biljana, one minute on that, please, only. Okay. I, I'm pretty sure you have something to <laughs> say that, to add to no, that. No. I'm just uh, uh, reminding uh, my young colleague that uh, Greece, yes, and we have a saying, you are indebted like a Greek. Dolzhen kako grčka in our language. So it is something that is very much in use in this region. When you want to say that someone is too much uh, in depth, uh, you use, you are indebted like a Greek. So it is uh, uh, really a, an old saying because of hi historical reasons, and you're right. But let me remind you that we are talking about the capital, the banks coming from European power centers. So. Yes, Varoufakis was fighting against this, this uh, policy of bailout that actually indebted even more the, the Greek people and put the burden of the debt crisis on the weaker uh, layers of the society. So not on the rich people, not to tax, uh, to tax the, the rich people, but to put the burden on the poor people. So that's not really... Um, European solidarity in my mind. That's not how I imagine it. Thank you for sharing that other perspective. Um, yeah. Welcome. Thank you. I'm uh, Anne Vela. I'm, I'm from Portugal. And talking about that, <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> we are <laughs> like the Greek. So <laughs> yeah, and uh, this uh, Europe, I, I believe in, in, in um, EU, uh, in Euro Europe. I believe on this, and I like to be uh, to be on uh, EU. 
but um, I think uh, um, there are no perfect systems. Unfortunately, <laughs> there are no, and we have a lot of uh, good things and a lot of things that are not so good. And we are uh, right now. I think Portugal is recovering slowly, but we are recovering. But for example, we have uh, a lot of uh, sacrifices. Uh, for example, just to give my example, I'm an assistant professor and probably I will die as a system professor <laughs> because our salaries were frozen, our car careers uh, were frozen, so we are all the time like this, so we, we cannot um, aspire to progress in our careers because there are no, no vacancies. So we have, uh, but I, I'm not complaining because I'm a lucky one. <laughs> there are a lot of people that are very worst about uh, because of this uh, debt that we contain with uh, when we enter to the Union Europea. But um, um, with the fact that I came here and I don't need to have a, a, a surveillance, a vigilance uh, only with a citizen, I think it is very good. <laughs> it's something that is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think this is very good, and uh, to know other cultures, it is very good. Uh, and uh, I think it is important to have people and movements like the one that you belong. belong. I think this is important because we need to um, advise the one that wants to go to the EU that uh, uh, some sacrifices are needed, a lot of sacrifices, and people need to be prepared to that face this. Um, of course that uh, uh, it is worth, I think it is worth to, to, to have this and to be part of the Union Europe because uh, as the reasons we discuss in the team, um, in the discussion we have, um, there are, um, we need, to, uh, we need to, to be stronger and we will be stronger if we are united. So I think it is worth to be part of this EU. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, there's one thing I actually have to add on that because uh, just recently we've been to Portugal, uh, to Lisbon in uh, Ericeira, and there we talked about uh, the financial crisis and the, the monetary system, and we called it money against conditions. And uh, there we kind of figured out how Lisbon and uh, Portugal made their way out of their crisis and that was really interesting and I recommend everybody to watch that talk show as well. <laughs> um, and unfortunately we have to come to an end now. Um, still there's one thing I'd like to ask everybody and just briefly in one and sentence please answer. There's an, an initiative that we have and we call that Playground for Youth. And within that initiative, we want to go to high schools and motivate young students to engage within their society. It doesn't really matter what society, but within their society. So what would you tell these young students in order to be a part of the society and to get going and to go forward? And what, what you, would you just tell those students? Uh, to use their time wisely and actively because at the very beginning maybe they, they will not see uh, direct outputs, direct benefits, but it's just uh, in economical terms opportunity costs. Uh, they, that sacrifice, not only in European Union, in every life it's sacrifice for every decision. This sacrifice is very useful for them and for their future generation and peers among uh, their society. Thank you. Actually, I, I would not need to put much effort in that message because according to the latest opinion poll, even 87% of the young population from in Macedonia wants to leave the country as soon as possible. So there is no need to encourage them to leave. The situation is so bad they are so desperate. There is such a negative uh, uh, selection of recruitment, partisanship of the public administration, corruption. The young people have really just one life, 
and they do not have the patience of the older generations. So yes, I usually uh, encourage my students, uh, I, I have this uh, um, luck to meet them in the first semester when they enroll at the university and to greet them at that point. And my basic message is learn at least English. That is uh, something that you need to open other doors. Uh, the, other, the other things would come, would follow. But first, uh, you need to know a language to communicate, and English is lingua franca, obviously. Thank you. Yeah, my point would be a bit more um, on the other side when it comes to this. I have a, a bit of a different uh, opinion when it comes to education itself. Uh, often hard work and dedication to something is very very much something that's very appreciated by other countries and nations that people need to be more engaged. When it comes to the youth, at least here, uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very rushing thing. You finish high school, you must get into college immediately. After you finish college, you must find a job quickly. And the population here kind of loses its, its impact to, to socialize and to learn other skills which can also be of benefit to them. Because yes, you can attend college and you can go to uh, volunteer work, practice, things like that, and eventually get a job. But don't miss out on other key aspects of life because you need to be pretty much involved in other sphere, spheres as well. Use the youth so you can become actively engaged, whether it's in a group maybe like this. Uh, use your time while we have it so you can you can learn those important social skills and eventually the time will come when you can uh, commit to something more serious. Just manage your time carefully the way you, you appreciate it. Make sure you have like a decent foundation for the future, but don't overdo it. Don't take too much effort into doing everything at once because there is time in life for, for everything. Just be, be smart about it. At least that's what I would advise younger people. Thank you very much. So. Now we will come to an end, and I hope that we managed to have a lot of uh, different nations from all over Europe here. At least we did that. Uh, you count it was eight different nations. <coughs> In general, it was eight different nations, eight different kinds of national inputs, uh, more than 20, 30 different views on different subjects, and I hope we could get our message across that we all human people, that we all understand each other when we talk with each other and that we all, at least the group that is here, wants to understand each other. And thanks for participating. Thanks for everybody. Uh, th thanks for everything. Thanks to everybody. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you for that factual, respectful and diverse discussion.